Welcome to Roundtable Live. I am Bear Taffy here on December 8, 2017, joined by Mathis Games, Rockley Smile, and Norton Lion, and a very special guest joining us today. It is Bennett Foddy. Thank you very much for being on the show. And he's muted. I am so good at this show. By now, you would, <laughs> after all the guests, after all this time, you would think I would learn. But no, all the greetings will forever be muted. Bennett, please, again, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining well, us. Well, thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Lovely to have you. As uh, as we have in uh, previous episodes, we will every now and then uh, talk to a developer about their uh, titles and their work and their life and interesting things uh, that they've done as a little bit of a deviation from our standard roundtable docket. So uh, that's what we're going to do today. It should be a lot of fun. We got Bennett on, of course, to talk about his very new release, Getting Over It with Bennett Foddy. Uh, many of you are uh, likely cursing his name to the high heavens as we speak. And uh, we'll, we'll give you the opportunity to uh, maybe get in some words edgewise as well at the uh, second half of the show. So get some questions ready for Bennett uh, if you've got them as well. But uh, we're just going to we're going to talk to Bennett Foddy today because we have well, we have a very particular fascination with getting over it with Bennett Foddy. Nick, actually, I think is kind of like the onus of it in our group. Yep. I'm very enamored with the game. Yes, I have to be honest. And I, I do want to say a big congratulations on yeah. the launch. Uh, Thanks, yeah. I'm really excited for you to see how this game has just blown up. Uh, it It's sort of a testament to what I do in a way that I feel like I've been really pushing to try and get quirky, weird games more on the radar. And I'm not claiming any responsibility for this, but I do feel really happy that so many people found out about it and were so excited watching the streams and stuff and how it just kept getting bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm excited for a an indie guy to get some some eyes on his game. No, I appreciate that. I think I think absolutely. It, you know, the more indie-friendly streams uh, did have an effect like that, right? I mean, it has to start somewhere, and uh, you guys had a lot of viewers as well on on those streams. So, so something about that was was sort of resonating, and I think absolutely, the the game could not have picked up in the way that it did without without streamers, which has been a kind of a new thing for me. I mean, I've, I've been aware, I've watched streams, of course, I've been aware of, of streamers, but I haven't really had a deep understanding of, of streaming culture at all. So it's been a real education for me as well, just to see how, like what the dynamics are there. It's kind of super interesting to me. That actually was, speaking of which, I, I'd like to open by reading a particularly relevant press clipping. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and see if you can guess who wrote it. I know Mathis is gonna know. This is a three okay. tweet screed mm -hmm. representing okay. getting over it. <laughs> I hate getting over it with every fiber oh, of my being. Exactly no game has left me with more hatred in my heart. I have no love left anywhere in my soul as a result of this terrible, terrible game. Tweet one. I urge every single person to stay as far away from it as humanly possible. Wish it only upon your worst of enemies, and even then you will be a cruel person for punishing them so intensely. <laughs> we do. I have thrown furniture, screamed my lungs out, and now have a full-blown migraine at the rage I have felt towards this demon in the form of a game. But this is a person who, for the life of him, can't break his own brand. He has become his brand. <laughs> What's it like to... Because I imagine that's the response you get often daily followed by like an asterisk that's like i really liked it like i had a lot of i hated many times throughout the game i was like kind of like oh fuck you but at the same time at the end i was like that was a wonderful experience you know i i got so much more of that with with quap i mean still I'm, I'm not sure who's whose quote that is if that's like uh, angry that is, video game nerd or uh no that's uh markiplier Oh, that's Markiplier. Oh, it's Markiplier, right? really? Oh, right. yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. You know, I, with Quop, that was the thing that everybody was, was doing. I got a lot of kind of tongue-in-cheek hate mail and, you know, tongue-in-cheek tweets and stuff like that. And uh, it's like a little bit of a wink. And I, I enjoy those. I mean, that's, that's cool. But it's almost like, you know, Quop is so many years behind us now that, you know, to my, to my shock and surprise, I feel like a lot of people who've played it don't like it's so much part of their um of their kind of understanding of how to play these sorts of games that they don't even come at me that way they're just like oh thanks that was <laughs> that was amazing you know uh which was a huge shock to me i mean i i, I guess i expected more of that kind of markiplier style uh style response and you know i'm fine either way it's, it's fine but i just it's been interesting to me to see the difference mm-hmm 
It's surprising to me that you are not as familiar as uh, your commentary would allude with the YouTubing and streaming side of things. Like you didn't make, you know, kind of a coy mention about how a lot of po folks are probably just watching this on YouTube or Twitch, right? Yeah. So yeah. You, you haven't really watched a lot up till maybe recently then? No, not at all. I mean, if mm -hmm. I'm, you know, to be completely honest with you, I there's, there's a side in every designer of difficult games mm -hmm. where you're a little bit, uh, a little bit resentful that people would would watch the game instead of play it. It's like mm -hmm. you know, I set this. this <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying to do something where I'm making something hard for people. Yeah. And if they're watching somebody else do it, that's that's not hard, right? That's. I, I definitely understand the ways in which that's a rich activity, and it's kind of like a like a you know a rich culture, of course. But I, it's it's not. It's not like people are, are sort of uh, struggling in the way that I want them to be struggling when they're watching that. And I realized, you know, I was, it was actually when I was building that part of the game where I say that, where it was just striking me, like I was like, oh, you know, uh, you know rubbing my fingers together, like I can't wait for people to get stuck here. This, I'm yeah. going to make this really tough. And then I was sort of s sitting there thinking, well, most of the people who experience this are going to experience it by, by watching it, right? Uh, and I have to get to grips with that because it's not 2008 anymore. And it, you know, it, it now is the landscape of games is, has changed through streaming so fundamentally. Yeah. And my first gut reaction uh, was a little, a little, uh, maybe resentful is too strong, but a little bit like uh, disapproving. And uh, so, so I wanted to record that line, but then you know, by the time that I got to the end, I was like, no, I mean, I, I want, I want to carry that into it as, as part of the expectation. I sure. want this to be like meaningful for people who are watching it. But also like, I think the thing that, that I didn't fully understand that I think actually works reasonably well in the game in the end is it's, it's everybody kind of experiencing what the streamer is experiencing in, in watching like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they're, yeah. they're, it's they're, they're they're getting some part of your experience by watching you do it that vicarious gratification mm -hmm. right it's not, not just gratification of course but frustration yeah <laughs> right uh, yep vicarious frustration <laughs> yeah uh it's, it's so i mean i still don't fully understand it um in in the sense that you know i, I think I, if i was to have a second crack at designing a game for streamers i could take so much away from this that i could roll mm -hmm. into it yeah uh, there are things that, that work really well that I would want to do again, but then there's sort of other things that I'm, that I might want to try. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it, yeah, it, it definitely has been this kind of huge education and I, I didn't realize a lot of the dynamics that go on between you guys and the people watching you as well. Um, you know, the, as people know by now, if they've watched your streams, there's at the end, there's this thing that says you can't, go to the to the reward i framed it as a reward at the time yeah uh if you're still streaming and just watching uh some of you like get to that point i was watching i guess lyric uh mm -hmm. just agonized at that moment <laughs> and he you know he uh sort of disgraced himself in that oh. moment and uh and streamed the 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 reward he and did it he yeah. did, yeah. No. He did. And he, you know, he immediately like apologized to me. He was like very, uh, he's very ashamed. But <laughs> I, I think it was in that moment that I didn't, I sort of had to, I had to realize something new about what was, what was going on there that I had not appreciated at all the, the way in which you guys are aware of your audience and you mm. feel, um, you feel certain kinds of moral obligations to them and you feel a relationship with them. Yeah. Yeah. And it, just seeing that on lyrics face, the, the kind of agonized, like, uh, like he'd be betraying his fans if he didn't stream it, but he also didn't want to like, uh, sort of, uh, you know, ch check a disclaimer that, that says, I solemnly swear I'm not streaming this. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it was just like, I, I, I felt like I understood something new about what's going on here. It's very particular, right? It's a very, um, it's a very new, this culture. I don't think there's yeah. anything else that sort of, uh, that is the same that we can relate it to culturally. Yeah. That came earlier.
that observation is very accurate i feel like that the twitch twitch streamers are well at least like a lot of the variety streamers uh tend to be very community focused so you're very <laughs> correct in that observation that he more than likely did feel kind of a moral obligation to do that for his audience right yeah, so it's it's a very interesting new dynamic for sure. Yeah, I guess it's different on YouTube because you're not so much getting uh, getting comments in real time. Right. Yeah. But yeah. So anyway, yeah. Just this has been this has been uh, interesting and and yeah. So I I guess coming back to your your sort of original uh, sort of angle, I, I I I didn't really anticipate most of this. This has been this has been really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting because you know part of it is the kind of game I wanted to make already that was like a sort of uh, moving on, revisiting some of the themes in Quop and doing it bigger mm -hmm. uh, works really well with this culture in a way that I didn't super predict, but it's interesting. I'd like to come back and do it again, I think. Can you talk a little bit more about, I think you even maybe uh, wrote, I think it was maybe a blog post or something about new um, control methods. Like you, you seem to have a fascination with control schemes that have not been used very often or are otherwise, you know, like very unique. Totally, yeah. Has that always no, been I, a fascination? Yeah, as a player uh, as well. Um, I grew up on, uh, originally on the, the ZX Spectrum, the British computer that doesn't have a controller. It doesn't have arrow keys either. So mm. it's just letter keys and numbers and-, and That so, explains so much like right. immediately. <laughs> right. <the Right>. <laughs> <laughs> that was all of my original games were just keyboard keys. And when you look at those games, there's no orthodoxy about what the keys should be either. It's just, they just pick some stuff. And you're sure. often like doing this kind of thing with your, your fingers trying to get to all the keys on the keyboard. And, you know, sometimes that's a disaster. It's terrible. And sometimes it works really well. And I guess then, you know, later in the sort of shareware era, late nineties, uh, this sort of freeware and shareware starts to become like more experimental. And I played games like uh, Ski Stun Simulator, which was one of the earliest physics games that I can think of, uh, and Elastomania, which is like a, it's like Trials. Trials is kind oh, of yeah. weirdly not real physics, but, but Elastomania is like a sort of faithful physics game uh, where it's like a 2D uh, Trials game where you're just trying to collect apples. Um, and those games have, have very strange input me methods too. And, and I just sort of feel like we haven't really scratched the surface of what input schemes can be. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, it's weird how, to me, how many games is, uh, are using WASD and mouse. Mm -hmm. uh, it's weird how many games use the arrow keys or an eight-way joystick or, you know, whatever it might be. And part of that you can understand is like, uh, you know, if you have a console, you have to have a fixed controller, or if you, uh, if you have an arcade machine, you're trying to get cheap components. But... You know, it, it's just this, even with that constraint, there's a lot more that you could do. So yeah. uh, to me, those are the games that I, I love. I love that style of learning where your brain is sort of learning stuff that you can't put into words. And a lot of that comes out of weird controls. Definitely. Uh, so that, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a fascination of mine. That is a very interesting thing to consider in like, as you mentioned, yeah, like we're, we had to, for the longest time, just deal with the literal physical restraints of the hardware and, now that people aren't having to abide by those restrictions, you know, like not just the hardware, but they also have, I believe, people in general more freedom to mm. be able to just do what they want to do, which I'm mm -hmm. sure you're well aware of too. Mm. Yeah, so yeah I mean, I think that, that uh, you know, some, some people have been freer with this than others. What I really like about uh, Nintendo hardware over recent years, since the Wii, I guess, uh, actually since the Nintendo 64 is even when they were providing a kind of fixed hardware system for, for controls, they were encouraging designers to say, well, Hey, how should you hold these controls? Right? Like what should you do with them? Mm. Uh, and, and there's a lot of kind of variety in that. If you play switch games, it's like all these different sorts of things they get you to do with the controllers, just yeah. shaking it up. Mm -hmm. Right. Like try turning a controller sideways, have a thing where you have to put the controller down, you know, uh, there's there's all this different stuff that you can do even with even with just a regular controller and i i i mean i i like genre games as much as anybody i i play a bunch of them but mm -hmm. uh I, what i i guess you know i'm i'm nearly 40 years old i've played a a ton of of video games yeah, yeah. a ton <laughs> a lot of video games and 
you know, I love a well-made game, of course. Uh, but what really moves me is something that feels new. And they still come all the time. Mm-hmm. But they're in the minority, right? So yeah. I, I, I really treasure the ones that feel and work differently, even if they're not super good. I'd love to hear, like, are, are there any particular unique, interesting games that you've gotten your hands on recently that you've b- become enamored with? The one I've been obsessed with this world, this year is Rain World. And oh, yeah. I kind of, I, I, I liked it at first. I, I, I kind of bounced off it a little bit um, because <laughs> like, like getting over it, it sort of sets you back a lot, a long way, a lot of it. It's erasing your, your progress. Mm. Uh, but also similarly, it's sort of like you, you learn things that it never teaches to you. And I, I had this kind of nice moment where I was talking to a friend of mine. We both played it about the same amount. And we had learned just almost completely non uh, overlapping things over like four or five hours of play. Uh, I'd learned all this stuff about how the spears work, how the plants work. And he had figured out all this other stuff about how the sort of systems work and the, and the kind of, uh, this is thing where you can swallow things and hold on to them. And it just made me feel like I just hadn't even scratched the surface of that game. So we started playing it hot seat, which I really recommend if you, if you have a game, that is super annoying to play uh where it's a little bit too enraging uh just to hot seat it with somebody else yeah, you'll you. pass back and forth yeah. exactly mm-hmm. yeah uh, it works super well for that you can make a co-op game out of any uh irritating game mm-hmm. um so so we've been doing that and and playing yeah rain World, just making a little bit more progress the whole time and it's just like super good way of, of doing a, a co-op game and I've been co-oping my summer car as well, the Finnish, right. but like the, the weird sort of super hardcore version of, of uh, Jalopy, um, which, which is again, like super good. It's just like, it's, it's, uh, I was saying to you before stream, you know, I, I think of this, I think of this as anti-design. I think anti-design is one of the kind of coolest, hottest things that's happening in games right now, because we had since like 2008 uh, or 2005, I guess, Cave story. I'm going to say since cave story, we've had in, in sort of, at least in indie games, but I think just in games generally, this sort of focus on good design, meaning good design is a game that you can instantly understand how to play, or you can learn how to play just by playing it. You don't have to read a manual. It's very smooth. There's no frustration. Everything's completely in your control the whole time, even if it's difficult, right? Uh, that, and the, the difficulty ramp is perfectly correct. And you're, you're I, saying all these things and you're saying them like phrasing them as though there's going to be a but at the yeah, end, but it's like, there, but these there, are all there, really good things, right? Like I think there are, of of this. <laughs> there's always, there's room for experimentation yeah, yeah, in every yeah. direction. And sometimes not tying up loose ends is the statement that actually defines it. Right. I don't want to give up on good design. I like those games. I think it's good that we continue to figure out what the tricks of the trade are and what the orthodoxy should be. Mm-hmm. But we're also going to miss some things that way, right? We're going to miss some, some ideas that you can't have if you like, so uh, example would be, I've been talking to my friends recently about platformers. Um, the orthodoxy now is that jumping is slightly buffered, meaning that if you pre- start to press jump just before you land, you'll jump again. Mm-hmm. But it's like two or three frames usually for a modern platform game. It's almost across the board, that's the rule. Uh, there's no modern platformer where there's no buffering, where uh, you have to jump after you hit the ground, uh, which was how it was, of course, back in the 80s and 90s, mostly. And there's no game where you can buffer your jump like right at the beginning of your previous jump, which is the case in some uh, some games. I think like uh, Prince of Persia 2008 would be a recent example. Mm. Uh, Dark Castle back on the original Macintosh would be an example. And it's just it's just... Fine. I mean, maybe that is the best rule, but you might have all kinds of games that you can get out of doing it the other way. Mm-hmm. Uh, flavors, uh, just different flavors. And I think you should be able to cook with all flavors. So I'm, I'm happy for people to still have a sense of what good design is, but it's really refreshing to play some games that are badly designed in interesting ways. Not just, not just any old bad design, right? Yes. But just in, in ways yeah. that, that have an interesting flavor. And Rain World is full of that. It's like really outsidery. There's all these things that, that just you, you, you would never do, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's really interesting from that point of view. Like you can't really judge your jumps. The way that you do a long jump is super finicky and, and weird. 
Uh, and there's just lots of little, there's lots of little things about it that are just wrong. They're wrong, but they go together to make a really interesting and, and nice flavor that I like. Uh, so Nick, you played Sexy Hiking, right? Yep. How, how far did you get? Mm, I don't know, maybe two, three levels in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's about how far I can get. <laughs> I've, watched, I've watched friends beat that. It, it's difficult to get further, though. Mm -hmm. So that was the, the inspiration for uh, getting over it was Sexy yeah. Hiking by Jaswo. Have you actually been able to get in contact with Jaswo since then? Uh, I tried to. He's uh, pretty hardcore out of games uh, in the sense he doesn't respond to emails from about games anymore or uh, Facebook messages or anything like that, um, which I totally respect. Sure. Uh, he was active, you know, back in his uh, sort of heyday was 2002, uh, which is a long last time ago. It was, it was 15 years ago. Yeah, so, man. Uh, you know, I, I kind of like that he sort of mysteriously vanished. Mm hmm it makes the games even cooler. I mean, he's got other really interesting things too. He's got this one that's like sexy hiking, but it's, you've got this weird hand and you throw like a ball. It's like golf, except you're throwing a ball. Uh, it's also super, super duper difficult to, to play. And yeah, I, I had been getting my students at NYU to play sexy hiking and sort of one of those rare games that is sort of resonates with students. Like usually you get them to play old games. They're like, okay, that was interesting, but I don't care. Yeah. But yeah. that's a game where they're like, no, like a certain number of students are always like, I have to finish this. I have to get to this. <laughs> uh, and there's just something fascinating about it. And I was went looking at like original coverage of it as well. Mm -hmm. um, my friend, Adam Saltzman, uh, Cannibalt and Overland guy. Uh, is on a forum somewhere just just ragging on it. He's so mad about it. Uh, it's funny because he's kind of embarrassed of this now because uh, it's like history is is not treated this kindly. But he, uh, yeah, he's just like, you know, we're we're all involved in this project of trying to make games good, and here's this guy who's made this thing that's bad, like almost deliberately. Yeah. Um, but I feel a kind of a kinship to that because, you know, like, of course, you know, Co-op is one of the most well-known shit games. Uh, I feel like people who make shit games have to have some kind of, like, shared characteristic. That's a hell of a label to place on it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's like a, it's a Japanese term, right? They have this term, uh, kusoge, kusoge, kusoge uh, like a shit game, literally. Oh, okay. Which is a whole category of games for them. Huh. And it's just... Is in Japan, Co-op is the biggest of anywhere. It's the biggest in Japan. Mm -hmm. And um, it's been on like a lot of daytime TV shows there. But they just take it, you know, it's just awesome. a, given there, it's a shit game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just have to embrace that, you know. It is a shit game. <laughs> I, I can't deny that. It's sort of busted in all these different ways. So, yeah, it's like anti-design. It's like a thing that I feel like Goat Simulator gets at a little bit. Uh, mm. But not just kind of co-op style games. It's like even things like Rust, um, all of these games that are kind of put together from kind of shit assets. Uh, and um, sometimes they, I mean, there's so many of these on Steam and mostly they don't kind of work out, but sometimes they just, uh, some, something catches on it as a little hook. Yeah. I'm super into, interested in that. That's, that's like, how do you even do that as a designer? That's where I was coming from here. And it's what Jazzo was doing with, with Sexy Hiking as well. Mm -hmm. Like most of the things in that game, he didn't like draw the sprites or make the music. The music's from uh, Donkey Kong Country 2 or something like that. Uh, it's just, yeah, it's, it, that's a different way of making games. People making games are so usually so particular about making every single thing that goes in there in a way that we would never ever do uh, for film or for, for, you know, for TV or anything like that. Uh, in games, if you're going to have a chair, you have to make the chair. Right. It's just a universal rule. Mm -hmm. uh, so it feels very rebellious to, to be like, no, no, I'm going to get the worst chair I can find on Google. I'm going to put that in. <laughs> Sounds like uh, Wild Animal Racing or whatever that thing you guys played was. Yeah, see, I wonder, if there were, I wonder if that developer was in on the joke or not. I have to believe they were, but... I think that is part of one of the big distinctions here is whether or not they intend it to be received as sort of a B game or not. Uh, because like you said with Rust, I mean, sometimes I think they're trying their most earnestly and sometimes those little quirks start to add up until all of a sudden the sum total is like, oh, wait a minute, this is a little off mark. 
Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, you pay you pay weird, unexpected penalties for it as well. It's like right. I get what looks like a low poly chair from SketchUp Warehouse, and I throw it in, and uh, you know, it looks like uh, you know, nineteen ninety three Quake One era chair. Mm-hmm. But in fact, it has a hundred thousand polygons and three, three <laughs> different materials. And it's like, oh no, I can't use this chair. This chair's too crap. <laughs> and a lot of what I wound up having to do on this project was like mitigate the impact of that kind of thing. Like mm. I would build a section of mountain in like two minutes, and then spend better part of a month fixing it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like every surface was incredibly meticulously uh, designed though. Like every angle that every part of the hammer hits into seemed like you designed it very intentionally. Is that right? I wrote down, the way that I did it is I wrote down a long list of little ideas, little uh, Mm -hmm. what I call design molecules. And um, then put them in combination with each other. And so it's like, I, you know, uh, slippery slope that you have to try to stop yourself on or uh, you know like a, a a chimney that you have to wedge yourself in and i would just build it and play until that little molecule was would work right and then mean, meanwhile you're also trying to make some sort of visual sense out of what you're doing right because i think of it as kind of largely also if you're going to work with shit assets you have to think carefully about how you're laying them out so that it's like a collage that just doesn't look terrible uh, and that it comes out of that, but a lot of those interesting things are discovered rather than constructed. Like, and I think that's true of puzzle games as well. Um, talking to Stephen Lavelle, who made uh, Stephen Sausage Roll, about half of his puzzles are like legitimate. I just had an inspiration, and I mm-hmm. uh, he's like a you know, he's a puzzle genius, and he just comes up with these puzzles, and they're perfect, and he makes them. But then the other half, he just got a computer to randomly generate 100,000 levels and played them until they until he found one that he liked. Oh. Uh, so you do both, I think, as a designer. So not everything that seems like a genius thing in my game is is uh, constructed. Some of it is like, oh, I, I played it and I was like, oh, that's cool. Uh, that was <laughs> totally placeholder and then I just kept it. Uh, there's definitely a few things like that, like that bit where you go up the chimney and then if you go a bit too hard, you fire out over the tree. Oh. Everybody accuses me of being diabolical there, but that was uh, that was just something I liked after I found it in there. Mm-hmm. So it's partly, yeah, it's partly design and partly discovery. Uh, even down to a very micro level, though, I think the angles of some of the specific rocks, the way they're set up sort of encourages momentum early on. Mm-hmm. And then later on in the actual design towards the end, I feel like those things are designed more so to punish you than to give you momentum. So, yeah, that's what I mean. Like, you really considered all of those little angles yeah. Uh, and I felt like you did on the way well, through. I, I, I definitely did in a lot of places. I think that uh, the kind of ice cliff at the end is designed so that it's just at the angle where you can wind up sliding back and mm-hmm. gaining enough momentum that you can fall back to the beginning of the game. Mm-hmm. If it was a little steeper, you would be uh, totally safe, actually, because you wouldn't mm-hmm. get enough horizontal momentum if you slide. And if it was a little flatter, you would never slide. Yep. Those sorts of things you tune a lot in physics games. Physics games are mostly tuning, honestly. Mm-hmm. Just taking little variables like what the angle of this cliff should be and just tweaking it and tweaking it and tweaking it until it feels right. Uh, I think that is design. I think that's a design process. But yeah, I definitely don't know those angles just sort of, uh, you know, uh, first off. I, I was just more pointing it out because there's so much going on that is sort of just under the hood that when you're just jumping over everything, it just you kind of go right past it. Yeah. But that is all meticulously considered stuff that adds up. And like, if you didn't fall back to the beginning, well, you'd notice that when you don't. Yeah, right. yeah, you, you yeah. would, right. Like if it, if it got to, the, to be like, uh, oh, everybody past this point never fails. Exactly. It would be, it would be lame, right? Yeah. <laughs> Antithetical, really, at, at the point yeah, of Yeah, exactly. I definitely felt the uh, sort of a pressure to, to, to let off the difficulty at certain points just to give you a rest. Right. Uh, and change the kind of feeling of it. Like when you're at the anvil, that, that's, it's like, oh, I'm going to put like a, a jump that people can only just barely make. But that's going to be safe. You're not going to fall from there. Because mm-hmm. uh, I, I really, the one biggest way that that game could fail is if it felt random. Like, and this is, the biggest problem with sexy hiking actually 
uh, is that in the end, a huge amount of it is random and sexy. This, you can't really, really speed run it. It's too right. glitchy. And I, I felt like there would be a level of randomness in my game. I thought the maximum speed you could do would be like 10 minute speed run. Mm -hmm. So to see this guy, Lumonen, doing like two and a half minutes. And uh, in a way, it makes me feel like I should have done more mountain, but in another way, it makes me feel like that's great because it means yeah. that it's not really very random at all. Mm -hmm. And if it took one person 20 hours and another person two and a half minutes, that difference is just skill, just experience and skill, which is so good. Like, that's a really good thing. Yeah. I'm really happy about that. I, I find that incredibly gratifying myself, knowing that I went from two, uh, two weeks to like two hours and now I'm down to 10 or nine minutes and something. It's like, <laughs> that's incredible. Like, I love that kind of level where it's on you to figure that out. Yeah. yeah. And the game gives you the tools and you figure it out through tutorialization and learning experientially as you play it. That's yeah. So good. yeah. I mean, I'm even, you know, I, it's so mental for me. I was playing on, on Kotaku stream today and I've been playing the last two weeks before the steam release, just testing, testing, testing. And I really wanted to get to the end of the game to make sure that that all worked. And I couldn't do it. I kept falling down. <laughs> from the, I, ah, it's just like losing it right at the end, like trying over and over again. And then I, I thought that that would happen for sure on, on, on Kotaku because I would, choke but then i cleared the whole game in 30 minutes wow <laughs> it was like i my previous best was like four and a half hours and somehow just having another person to talk to while i was playing it made the difference right yeah yeah so uh yeah it just shows how much of it is mental which i i like as well choking like i'm a, just a terrible choker at games not just video games but like i once lost a game of ping pong that i i was winning 19 to 2 wow yeah. That's something just, you remember. Yeah, no, that would yeah. stick with me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the moment when I realized, yeah, I, I'm a person who chokes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I love I loved that though. I love that kind of game where you can choke real bad. Mm -hmm. Something sort of magical about it because you can't really talk yourself into not choking. Or maybe you can a little bit, but it's not something that you have total power over and uh, I love I love that kind of magical element. I find any the, part of a game where you can't explain why somebody won or lost is really cool to me. Yeah, I find the the more I think about it, the more likely I am to choke personally. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a huge a huge part. Maybe I'm just always too much in my head, and I should just have somebody trying to distract me. Yeah, no, it can help. <laughs> uh, the yeah, there's been quite a few people speedrunning it now. Uh, Buckeye is actually a streamer as well. Had a couple of questions for you. I wanted to know if there was any part of the game uh, that you made that you found too difficult. I think you actually you even mentioned this in the commentary. How you said there were parts that you made very hard, but you could not bring yourself to actually make them any easier. Was there mm -hmm. anything that got to the point where you really did have to make it a little easier? It just was completely insurmountable. I made the chimney easier. It used to be straight up. Um, and I put it on a slight angle to make that a little bit easier. Uh, I made the, um, let's see, I made the, the concrete wall above the, the landfill. Uh, I spaced out the kind of the ledges on that, but really I didn't make big changes to make things easier because you can get past almost anything in that game. Right. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing, the two things that took me the longest uh, in testing were the anvil and the bucket. And I guess the anvil, I, I, I didn't know that it was possible the way I had it set. And I just, some kind of stubbornness welled up in me. I just refused to, to tweak it mm -hmm. after I laid it out. I just like, no, I, I'm convinced I can do this. And it took me about three hours of just trial and error. And it's weird because now I can do it every time. It's just a method. You having the right method is just the thing. Yeah, I was yeah. just trying the wrong thing over and over again. But that uh, I put in the I put in the present there at that point, and I put in there's a little I don't know if you've seen, it, but there's a little hook on the cliff to, to give you the, the, the wrong idea, um, to give you the idea that you can use the hook. <laughs> I don't know if I ever um, even noticed that. If if you get really stuck, you'll notice it. Mm. And yeah, the bucket. I did on my first try <laughs> and then I couldn't do it again for another six hours and I could have made that easier as well. But uh, yeah, I just, uh, 
I tended to err on the side of just not wanting to make things easier. I made them harder yeah. all the time. Uh, but it just felt like defeat to make them easier. Yeah. It's like cheating. It's like I'm using the ultimate cheat code. No, I think that was the way to go because if you make it any easier, I mean, you, you kind of have to give people the benefit of the doubt that they're going to be incredibly good and sort of if, you're, if your point is to make a really painfully difficult skill game, you cut it way higher than you think it should be and then they're going to do way better than that even. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I made, when I made GURP, I was convinced that, that nobody would get to the top. And right. Speed run for that is like a minute and a half. Jeez. <laughs> people are robots man they're so yeah. good <laughs> they're robots well in this case it turned out it was there was like a competition war between two speed runners and they were both jugglers it's like juggling in that case uh when i made clop again i i i never finished that game and i never will it's stupid it's it's a dumb game it's not, <laughs> but i knew someone would finish it anyway within like five minutes of me posting it online it's just yeah and now there's speed runs of that they're like two minutes as well right yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, you can't, you can't, you never underestimate how good people are in games. Crazy. So I got to ask, when I got to the end of the game the very first time, and you were there, you saw it happen, mm -hmm. I, I hooked myself over the end of the tower mm -hmm. and then fell back down. And yeah. I was the first person to do that? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just love that that's a thing. So... You said you're going to add a bit of commentary. Did that end up happening in the the Steam yeah, version? It's in there. If you wind up with your uh, hammer on either side of the base of the the tower, it says um, it says you got the bad ending. I just oh, whispered yeah. really, really quietly. Honestly, very meaningful to me that I made a very small impact in this yeah. game somehow. So thank you for that. Yeah, I enjoyed that so much watching that. I just didn't want to make it. It'd be easy to make it impossible for that to happen. Yeah. Uh, it's just too funny, though. I genuinely believe that was the legitimate ending to the game when he did it. Like I thought, that <laughs> I was wouldn't how have been surprised. It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the end. I mean, in a way, it is almost the conclusion in that you can never fall back down. Yeah. So right. you just eventually decide to turn the game off whenever you're done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. He's safe. He's safe. safe. <laughs> yeah, that was the whole goal. Yeah. <laughs> That would have been a way to end it, right? Would have been to have like a hook or something like he hangs yeah. up his, his pot on a hook or something like that and yeah. you're safe. You can never fall again. Uh, yeah, it's kind of nice. But I just, uh, yeah, made it that uh, gravity releases its hold on you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I don't mind. I don't mind that you got stuck. I think that was right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously I was, I was emotional at the moment, but in reflection, I was actually, I was kind of into it. It made sense. <laughs> Let me ask you guys a, a question sure. about this. When, when you're playing a game like that, that's, that's frustrating. Uh, do you, do you deliberately like give in to, to, to kind of rage in order to, to kind of perform it, to expose it to your audience more? Or is that just, are you just overcome? Cause I did see, I saw, um, soda pop I guess, uh, one of his streams, he had to apologize to his fans cause he lost it too bad. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I, you know, I, <laughs> I guess he'd been playing it for like 10 or 12 hours and he fell all the way back down. And I could believe that, that everything that he shows there is like really just, just genuine, just genuine anguish. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is great for me to watch, but you must be like, you must be trying to kind of, is, is it a weird sort of mental thing you have to do to kind of surface that for people? Um, it's interesting because, like, growing up playing games, I used to get really, really mad at video games that were really hard, but I internalized it a lot. Um, never really broke a controller or anything, but I think now that, at least having done this as, like, a job for, like, five years or something, it's now habit for me to vocalize everything. Right. So when I get frustrated, even when I'm not, like, on camera or anything, it's way easier for me to just vocalize how frustrated I am with something. So it's kind of become normal for me to just be like, ah, fuck this game or whatever is pissing me off. Right. See, I'm like exactly the opposite. Uh, <laughs> I feel like at, the more the spotlight is on me, the more I feel like a desire to maintain some kind of adult decorum mm -hmm. and anything that pierces the veil of that, <laughs> uh, which has happened during getting over it is a point of great personal shame and almost a regression into a vulnerable juvenile childlike state. <laughs> So <laughs> that's a great, uh, yep. I think that's a great way to, uh, that, that's a, 
a, a token of pride for a developer such as yourself to have made a game that kind of does break down the veneer that you put up when other people are watching you. And, you know, I've had some moments of genuine frustration, but I think more so than getting angry, I just get like a sort of quiet resignation. And uh, I'm just like, well, you know, here we go. I'll be better at it the next time I go up the mountain, hopefully. But I, uh, yeah, I, mean, I, I think I, a lot... Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Go, go ahead. Oh, I think a lot of people sort of, uh, they see themselves when they're performing as sort of a, uh, their, their self as to the second power, where mm -hmm. everything is sort of exaggerated through this magnifying glass. And uh, I, I don't really do that myself, but I do get in moods occasionally where I'll be more prone to, uh, to flipping out a little bit. Like I was playing Dancing Lion, this mobile game on my stream the other day. And that game, for some reason, makes me more angry than getting over it by far. I was gonna say, I love that that's gonna be your example of like, the induction of pure rage comes actually from maybe Dancing Line. Some of the most angry I've ever been on my stream because I was just pissed off that they had the audacity to have a stamina system when I just couldn't get around the goddamn rock with this line. <laughs> it's if you, yeah, if you saw the game, you'd understand. It's just, it's more about that they set up the monetization to be obnoxious than it is that the game is obnoxious. And every time I'd fail, I would get closer to having to watch an ad. And that was just <laughs> reminding me of everything I hate about mobile games. Yeah. So that's, I was just kind of losing it there. But that's good. To be fair, it's like, High stakes in a game. That's what you want. <laughs> you know, feeling of like it matters whether you win or lose. <laughs> I, I want to try and be mature as much as possible. And I, I do get into these modes, though, where I'm just like, fudge. I just have to say fudge a lot. And for some reason, that, that's all I need. It's just one little expulsion, and now I'm back to good again. So, as, a, I mean, as a designer of these sorts of games, I really enjoy um, when people react in a way that, that seems like they couldn't help it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. No. Uh, of course, I feel like there's this kind of performative thing, but uh, I think actually, I think one of you, uh, I was going through all of these different clips of, of people playing my game to put a little trailer together for, for, my, uh, for my Steam launch. And some of them are, are just like, uh, they're, they're performing too much. And I'm like, yes. ah, that's uh, fake. Yeah. Uh, the, one, the ones I liked the most, which I didn't put, I couldn't put in the trailer, unfortunately, but the ones I liked the most were where the, there's just silence, right? The person yeah. you know, falls down and it's just like they said, 20 seconds of dead air. Yeah. God, I ended so many episodes. Oh, I've done a few of those too. Air. <laughs> I, like, I sit there for a minute at the end of the episode, I'm like, am I going to try again? Like 20 seconds of not saying anything, just hitting end record. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like no, I'm done. Uh, there's, there's one, I think it's a, I think it's a bear clip. It's like, uh, it's like 20 seconds of dead air. And then it's like, well, start again. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's yeah. Where I just take the snake right all the way down. Yeah. I, yeah. I remember that one fondly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Finally. <laughs> because it's fun. like, it's really what I want. It's, it's what I want. That's the exact emotion. It's not the rage yeah. that, well, I'm going to start again. Uh, and that was what was great about those, uh, those those soda popping clips is like he kept he kept going right he yeah, would lose yeah. it and then he'd just keep going you're like what are you doing <laughs> just stop take a, take a little break yeah yeah it was that's what i i mean i love that restart to to echo <laughs> off these sentiments too like i I've, I've found that as we've been doing this over the years i I like I will play a lot of games and there are quite a few games that will not elicit any sort of emotional response from me and that's fine you know like I'll play a lot of games that don't have to do that but it's actually like even more gratifying to me now when I do find the ones that give me that sort of resonation and getting over it absolutely you know unsurprisingly had that res or drew that response out of me mm -hmm. and that is another testament to quality like it's uh it's a it's a feeling that I miss uh, that I would often get as a kid, you know, playing games. It was it was very easy to come by. You know what I mean? It was not difficult to reach that level of emotional investment. Whereas as an adult yeah. and having that much more experience under my belt, it's a lot more rare these days. You know, it, it's also quite interesting too that in this very particular instance, the fact that you're getting really upset and angry and your hand is starting to claw at the mouse, mm -hmm. that actually makes the game harder. Yep. You know? Yeah, I actually like when during like a recording day when I was recording, uh, getting over it. That was the game I did last because when I was done with that, game, I was done playing games for the day. At the end of every session, of, of I'd walk into getting over it really optimistic, like, "All right, I'm gonna make progress." I'm like, "I know where I am. I know what I need to do." And at the end, I usually ended up 
further back than I had started, and I was just done. And I just wanted to play yeah. any game for like hours. Because mm. then my hand would start to hurt, and my wrist would start to hurt, but I wanted to keep going, and muscles were tensing, and it just was a disaster. Gamer yeah, that's injuries. definitely what happens to me. When I'm, playing the, when I'm playing this game, I go really, really well for the first 15 minutes or 20 minutes or however long it takes me to have a fall. Yeah. And every fall makes me a little worse. Yep. And then I just have to stop. It's like from here, it's like, I, I think back to like athletics at high school or whatever. And, and uh, you would always, if you ran a sprint, okay. you'd always feel like it wasn't fast enough and you'd want to go again. But of course you get a little slower every time. Right, yeah. <laughs> so you definitely feel like, which I can't understand. I <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to ask, uh, getting over it has a, a strange arc to its release that is very atypical for games. It almost mm-hmm. reminds me more of like when a, when like an indie film, like The Big Sick comes out or something like that. And for a while, you know, it's like, it gets great word of mouth in these like New York and LA and then slowly it expands across, you know, the greater world. But like, what was it like? And what was the decision-making process like and the thought process behind it to start and be like, well, we'll, we'll start with this, you know, promotion with Humble and then slowly watch it kind of pick up steam as it, as it came to steam, ironically enough, I pick guess. Steam. Yeah, I mean, it... <laughs> So the, the story behind it is that it wasn't really a decision, uh, not like a strategic decision. Humble came to me and they said, we want to commission you to make a game for our bundle. Uh, we're looking for things that are weird that wouldn't normally get made. It's like spice for them for their monthly subscribers because there's always like AAA and triple I indie games in their bundle every month. And they wanted something a little bit weird. And I looked at the other things that have been made. There's a lot of great games that have been made in these commissions but um, nothing had really kind of hit and it seemed like in the amount of money that they were offering it's like ah oh, yes i can make like an uncommercial game right mm-hmm. gonna make a I finally get to make that sexy hiking game i've been meaning to make because nobody's gonna like that <laughs> uh and uh, so i i was like that's what i'm gonna do and uh, so i would not have made it otherwise right it was, it was this was the impetus to make the game mm-hmm. and i'm sort of midway along i'm like I'm actually starting to think this is a good game. Um, it's not. It's not just pure uh, massacre stuff. You know, I, I started to think like, it's 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 really weird. This doesn't happen very often in my life. I'd say count the number of times this has happened on you know one hand, if that. Uh, but I really felt like I knew what I was doing with the project. Mm-hmm. It's really rare. But at that at that point, it's it, you're starting to think well. Well, I wish I didn't have to have this kind of, uh, at that stage, going to be three months of exclusivity with Humble. I wish I didn't have to have that. I wish I could just do like a wide release because I'm worried this is going to just like, uh, nobody's going to see it because it's only some subset of Humble subscribers are going to download this and I won't be able to kind of push it in the right way. And, um, so I thought it was just going to die at that stage. Mm-hmm. Uh, it would be played a little bit and I was going to be fine with that. The deal is still like more than fair, but I thought that would be the outcome. And then, okay, so it comes out on Humble and it starts to pick up, first of all, with, uh, with, with yourselves and then uh, going to slightly uh, sort of more mainstream style streamers in, in America and then, uh, and then in Korea and then from Korea to China, as yeah, far yeah. as I can tell. And at that point, it's like there's something happening here and, and having to wait two months between that humble release and Steam before <laughs> I can actually sell it is just agonizing. It's really so stressful because it's not how you would do a launch normally. Uh, you're, you're just worried. All these, we're going to have this wave of streaming interest. And then by the time I can finally, I've got all these people telling me on Twitter, uh, hey, maybe you should have thought about... Uh, you should release your game because you're going to miss the <laughs> and you're not going to be able to make any money. These armchair devs, man. <laughs> yeah. Considered. Yeah. <laughs> Every day, just over and over and over. And all my, not just, not just randos as well. Like all my developer friends are like, dude, you should, uh, you should try to get out of this uh, exclusive. Oh. <laughs> uh, you know, which is not fair to humble, right? Because it's, that's the deal. Sure. They're taking a bet on something. Yep. Uh, in commissioning it and you know i would never have have made the game if not for that commission right so i can't regret it too much but it's so anxiety provoking and then 
I, you know, something like 2.5 million people had played it before the Steam release, which is wow. pretty weird because there's only 300,000 Humble subscribers. <laughs> um, oh. <laughs> it's very yeah, strange, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't add up. Uh, that thing doesn't seem to add up. Yeah, and as a designer, you want that, right? I mean, it's not... I don't want piracy, but I would much rather have 2.5 million people play it than zero. Yeah. Even for, this, for any given amount of money. Uh, so I don't feel super bad about it, but it was, again, just like more and more anxiety, like, am I missing all my sales? So I'm glad it's like selling well now. Uh, one thing we will never know is whether that kind of uh, thing where you couldn't get the game easily or you, you, know, you, you had to go through some kind of weird uh, or, or possibly illegal method to get it mm. um, helped to kind of boost its launch. I could give you at least one other example of that working out was Nidhogg, uh, Mark Essen's game. Right. Which you could only get under the table for, uh, for maybe two or three years after it first got announced. Everybody was talking about it and covering it. And uh, this was really before there was sort of streamers. But uh, when it finally became available on Steam, he sold like, you know, a million copies or something. So um, maybe maybe it's a just good business strategy. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Maybe I would have done much better if I had done like a normal thing. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I can't have any regrets. I couldn't have done it any other way. Mm hmm well, yeah, and to like uh, assuage the anxiety, at least to whatever length that I can, you know, there's so many people talking about how Steam has a huge discoverability problem right now. And you know, when with so many games coming out every single day, it really does take kind of something special to, to rise up and even be noticed. And it, even though it seems a little uh, unusual or aberrant in one way or the other, the fact that it was like, this is something made for this kind of curated service. Mm -hmm. and it's super weird. And it's, it's something you can't play in any other area. I think gave it a little bit of a visibility boost right off the bat instead of like, well, it came out on steam and it's like eight bucks, but I don't know. It's got two reviews right now. I don't know if it's good or right. Anything. Right. Yeah. Like uh, 58 games came out on steam the day that I launched. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? That's low. I think, yeah, I was going to say that's a low number. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that week, it was like the week before somebody said something like 178 games had come out on Steam and 71% of them had less than 10 reviews. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's it, you know, I think, I don't want to make too much of the whole kind of indie apocalypse thing. I think in a way it's, it's lovely that we live in this time when there's so many games, right? Yeah. Uh, we were all, when we were all kids, it wasn't like that. There was much, much less. And uh, you can really discover stuff that's perfect for you now uh, as a player, at least you should be excited as a developer. It's super scary. Mm. Uh, but you know, I don't want to, the worst, you know, the worst thing is when somebody has a game that sort of picks up reasonably well or any, any product, a film, book, and then they act like it was intended or that was like the secret is to make a weird massacre game that, that uh, doesn't save your progress. Yeah. And then um, they write a book about it and sell it to <laughs> <laughs> everyone. I mean, we get the same thing in our business. People go like, oh, what's the secret to success? And we're like, we don't right. know. If right. we knew the secret, we'd be well, way more successful. Yeah, yeah. We'd be really good. <laughs> the secret to success when we started in 2012 is different now anyway. Yeah. Probably true. But Everybody yeah. thinks right. they know the secret, but nobody really does. Yeah, I mean, making games is the same. This is an industry that changes completely every six months. And uh, you, know, that you can make some observations about what's going on. But the whole trick, uh, if there is a trick, is to, to try to ride the waves, whoops, uh, to ride the waves as they come, they come along. But... You can't say whether you did it deliberately after it happens. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Uh, but at any rate, the wave you're on has gone and you can't get anybody else on that wave at that, right. at that point. So um, I think it's important to have uh, a, bit of, a bit of humility about that. I mean, the only thing I would say is, you know, Rami uh, from Blambeer uh, always says this thing that resonates with me, which is that in a business like this, where there's so many more game developers and so many more games than anybody can consume in their lifetime. And it's changing so fast. The only thing that you can do is something that nobody else is doing. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not a formula for success. It's also a formula for abject failure, <laughs> but <laughs> you're really your only option. Uh, so, I mean, 
I took that to heart. I do try to do that, but yeah, it doesn't always work out. And I've released a lot of games and only two of them have hit. So there you are. Yeah. There's a, there's a very good point to make as well. Yeah. Like for people to be, be putting you up on a pedestal maybe as, you know, it's Bennett Foddy of getting over, over it with Bennett Foddy, but that's, you know, it <laughs> right. was also Bennett Foddy creator of what 40 plus games prior to getting over it. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And no, I'm, I'm just happy if like, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to put myself in, in the game as well. I'm sort of interested in this because it's like, I don't know. I mean, it's, you don't get that many opportunities to get people to play your games. Mm -hmm. Nobody really is going to play your entire life's work. Right. So if you want to get people to know who you are as a designer and what you're about, you kind of have to be intense about that a bit more intense than people uh, normally are. Yeah. Uh, it's not like with painters where it'd be like, well, I'm going to paint 500 paintings and people will pick the 20 that they like. And they'll have a pretty good idea of, what my whole thing is. No, you're lucky if people play one of your games. Yeah. So uh, I thought, well, what if I, what if I just put myself in there? Let's give that a try. <laughs> so did that, you, you had the idea to include your own VO from the start then I imagine. Pretty close to the start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right after I got started with the, once I had the, the input system working, what I was, where it came from was I was thinking about, well, I knew I wanted to do this thing where it would send you right back to me. That was just like such a core hilarious idea that mm -hmm. somebody would uh, get all the way to the end and then fall back to the beginning. Cause it's one of the things that I like the most about sexy hiking and also a lot of other games that I really like. Uh, even the souls games were a little bit like that. Right. Yeah. Hard. So there was a dark souls comparison in there. <laughs> we got it. From the developer yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the dark getting souls over it is the dark, the souls. dark souls of <laughs> <You're> getting <laughs> climbing, yeah. <laughs> yep i went there yeah uh but yeah no but that's a design problem right so uh if i just send you back and that's it and then you have to do it again there's something inhuman about that it's like a little bit inhuman um I was just trying to figure out what i could do to make it a little bit less inhuman and the idea just flows from there right uh, I've played a number of massacre games that are, they just do that. They just set you back and it's great. I mean, I, I like it just fine, but I, I really wanted to try to encourage people to, to go again. Right? Yeah, like I was yeah. saying before, that's what I'm into is when they go again. And I just wanted to find a way to push them to do that. So that's, and I had just played, I guess, uh, the beginner's guide. Um, mm, I love that game. The, the Davy Reading game. Yeah. And yeah, I think, He's doing his, he's putting himself in that game for a totally different reason. But it was interesting to me as, as that, like, I felt like he was with me the whole time I was playing his game. That's, yeah. that's like so nice. It's such a great thing. Um, so yeah, I thought I'd give that a go. So it was really from very early on. So if you've played a number of Massacre games, so do you have an opinion about like when they do the trolley kind of stuff in them, when they intentionally mislead you just to make you angry? Or when they drop presents from the yeah, sky that are well, full of bats. <laughs> no, I have a greater point. I was just, I was kind of wondering because the one thing that seemed sort of out of place in the whole game was the jump scare. Mm -hmm. Right. That didn't seem like it fit in with the rest of it, which was it, not that you tried to really make it easy for the player, but also for the most part, it seemed like it was just sort of a poke and laugh kind of, ah, you fell down. Oh, well, let's try again. The I mean, jump scare to me seemed aberrant somehow. It, it's coming from a different place. It's that's a joke for me. That's just okay. like that's just a gift to myself, actually. <laughs> okay, that's fair enough. I'm just curious. It, may, yeah, yeah. it makes the present a lot more appropriate. No, I mean it's an interesting question. It, it is coming from a different, uh, a different kind of design point of view. Um, it was like once I thought of the the jump scare, I I had to do it right. Yeah, and then when I implemented it it was so funny to me that I, I wanted to do it again. I mean, people are just lucky I didn't do it like 12 times. <laughs> it was funny to me over and over again. Um, at a certain point, at like the top of the mountain is just every single pixel. You don't know whether or not every, it's going to yeah. trigger another one. Wherever <laughs> the hammer contacts the ground, bats fly out of it. <laughs> but yeah, just, yeah, that would be good. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. 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 Just add a cheap box. Idea. That's all I ask. 
that bat model was best fifteen dollars over. <laughs> 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 but yeah, it's just I don't know. I mean, it's 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 rude. It's uh, it's cheap. Uh, but but yeah, it's to me. There's a couple of videos. There's like we were saying before. There's a certain a number of fake reaction videos to those jump scares because people. Yeah, yeah. It. But the real ones are are some of the best. Right, those <laughs> I, I winced the first time. I, yeah. I did a little bit of one of these. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what? Like, I, I haven't gotten there myself because the way that I play that game is once a week we play it for like an hour, and mm-hmm. I get a little bit further than I got last time, but not even close to the top. So I'm like maybe fifty percent of the way to the top. But uh, and and when I say fifty percent of the top, presently I'm at the bottom, but right. I have been fifty percent of the way to the top. <laughs> but watching other people play it, it reminds me of like. Uh, when movies will do a dream sequence that's like completely tonally dissonant with what the regular movie is like in, in super bad when there's that dream sequence where he slices the dude's throat with a bottle and like blood just pours out of his neck is that it's so comically <laughs> different than what is happening in the rest of the game that it, huh. it weirdly sort of has a place in it. I felt at least. That's, that's an that's interesting way to look at it actually. Yeah. I think that's really right. I mean, what I try to do with the bats is that the sound plays really short and then it cuts off suddenly and then the bats yeah. are just gone. And I wanted you to kind of almost like half wonder, did that actually happen? <laughs> it's like, it'd be like, if I could, I'd kind of gaslight people be like, oh, what are you talking about bats? There was, there was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that. I don't know, most of the massacre games I've played that I like are, are don't actually do that. I think to be fair, I like I really like uh, Punishment by Messoff, which just is what it says it's going to be. It's like mm-hmm. I don't know if you've ever played it, but it's like this series of rooms uh, that you go up, and every time you go up, you have to go back down to the bottom of the game and mm-hmm. press a button, and then you go up two, and then you go back down to the bottom up to up to level three, and so on until you've gone up to like fifty levels. And it never breaks from that. There's no, there's no jump scares. There's nothing bullshit in there. It's mm. just, uh, it's just that. And uh, you know, I respect that. I think that's really, that's really great. But mm-hmm. yeah, the the uh, the bat. That's uh, it's a little flavor of my my own sense of humor, I guess. You know, after the bat, when I got to the anvil and I saw there was a surface underneath, I was like, okay, so if there's going to be a jump scare, this is probably a trap. And if I fall, it's going to break and I'm going to fall back down. It yeah. didn't happen. And then I was actually, you subverted my expectations twice because yeah. then I was actually confused as to why it wasn't a trap. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I like the area under the anvil because it looks like it's not solid. So you think you're going to fall. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's like, no, I'm, I'm going to cut you a little break there. There's also that thing that saves you when you uh, are up near the, um, like the dog house and the, and the barbecue. Yep. Uh, same, same deal. Mm-hmm. Just like a little bit of a, uh, yeah, yeah, you're, you're okay. You're I'm okay. holding out hope that one day the barrier under the anvil will be removed and there will be a second path to a higher mountain. Ooh. Oh, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm ready to send you money if you ever feel like it. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Once I've recuperated, you know, I might, I might have more ideas for, for more mountain parts, but it, I, I stopped when I ran out of ideas. Is That's fair enough. Mm. <laughs> uh, great. So, uh, chat, feel free. You want to at Roundtable, or, yeah, at Roundtable Podcast in the chat. That'll uh, be the easiest way for us to be able to notice your messages. And uh, Ryan, Nick, and Mathis, if you could do me a favor and uh, look out for some good ones as well in the chat there. Uh, we'll field some questions for Bennett Foddy from the chat from you guys I'm right now. I'm going to sneak my own one in. Sure. First. And this is like, it's more of a pedestrian question, but I'm interested. Uh, how long in terms of like, I guess, hours was the development process? Because it has the perception, especially if it's predominantly you or maybe even exclusively you did it, of being a little bit more of a, a streamlined development process as opposed mm-hmm. to something that's, you know, unwieldy and extremely large. Yeah, it's a really good question. I'm interested in games that are made by single people. A lot of my favorite games are like that. But this thing that some people have the capacity to do where you make a single a game by yourself for like five years, I just, I just don't, I couldn't do that. It takes a, a level of uh, emotional power that I just, I just don't. I don't. <laughs> it's like what Stardew Valley did, right? There was like one guy for like five yeah. years. Mm-hmm. Well, I think uh, the sequel to The Fool's Air and The Fool and His Money came out a couple of years ago. It took him 25 years. Oh, jeez. <laughs> that's, 
a little longer than I've been alive. It, it's yeah. like a sustained no, level sorry, of a little self-confidence shorter. that I can't even imagine to start a project and then 20 years later be like, yeah, I'm still, <laughs> yeah. still This is still good and worth it. <laughs> so it took me, I guess I got started seriously in January. Okay. Uh, so to give you an idea. And I teach at NYU. Uh, I don't really have to do anything over the summer. So it was a little more than part, a little more than half time, I guess, for the duration of the project to give you an idea, but I, I was committed really uh, early on to the idea of um, Elan, right? Like this idea of uh, creative uh, freedom, of create, like of, of joy in creation, that I feel like making games is so set against that, not, not because of the people or the culture, but because of the technology. Uh, computers are terrible, right? It, you guys, you guys have. Oh yeah, we we hate them. We love them, uh, but we hate them. Right, and so easy to get kind of technically rat holed on a on a game yeah. project that that you just you just get stuck. You're like ah, oh. uh, and it, this does still happen to me because as you get better at at making games, you you get more ambitious and more demanding about things like uh, I had this thing where you know there's a the little cursor that that shows where your mouse is. And I wanted that to always be behind the hammerhead, but always in front of his body, mm -hmm. but and always definitely always in front of the pot. But the problem is the hammerhead is behind the pot, or it's like can go behind the pot, and that is a huge technical and design problem just to make sure that the mouse is always visible and doesn't clip through the pot. Yeah, and you can just disappear down that kind of problem for years. Right, not just that one thing, but things like that. And I just every time I found myself doing that, like getting stuck in that, I'm like, no, this was not the idea. The idea of this game from the from the get go was to to work freely. And that's why I wanted to embrace that kind of trash core asset core uh, aesthetic. Uh, was because it lets you like like working in a in a collage style lets you work really freely and. Uh, with less effort and in more of a kind of punk rock kind of way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a little bit. Um, and I feel like that's the best of my early games uh, was because I didn't have time or, or technical expertise to do anything differently than that. And it's not just me. It's literally every creative person ever in any medium is like this. Their first work. I, I, I co-work with a... With a uh, another game developer, ex-student of mine who's working on the game, uh, About. And we had like a Spotify playlist we were listening to all summer. And he, at some point he says to me, do you realize that everything you put on here is a first album, like somebody's first album? Huh. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that, I didn't realize that. <laughs> but it's true. It's like every album that I like is a first album. Mm -hmm. I, like, I like that moment when people don't really know how to use their tools and that gives them freedom to kind of be expressive in a way that... that. So... I do know how to use my tools now. Uh, and you have to be strict with yourself to, to really move quickly in that because you can, you can just become so oriented to craft yeah. and to make sure everything is functional. Uh, and yet I do want a certain level of polish, but I don't want to, I don't want to get focused on that. So it, it takes discipline. Absolutely. But yes, it was, it was absolutely deliberate to try to keep it to a short scope and work really fast. Uh, Kirx wants to know what was the first game experience you had that made you want to make a game of your own? Oh, that's a great question. You know, I fell in love, and this is such an idiotically commonplace story in our culture, I guess, but <laughs> I fell in love with games when I was like four years old or something like that, five years old. And if I try to think about what the first games that I, that were, that I, that I played, it's 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 tricky. I mean, it will be it will be like a ZX Spectrum or an Apple II, II game, something like that. Uh, it might have been, uh, for example, Karateka, uh, or um, probably something older than that, like uh, Swashbuckler on the Apple II, right? Yeah. And uh, the very I do know that the very first game that I saw, like from from moment one, I was kind of captivated. And I think I do remember back to when I was like five or six trying to make my own games, right? But I never, I'm, I'm, I was too distractible and lazy. 
and it took like 12 efforts before I ever managed to finish anything. And it was only once I got to like 2005, 2006, and there started to be an internet community of people kind of helping each other that I started to believe I could do it. Mm -hmm. So I really owe it to, uh, to like indie developers and in, in that community that I was ever able to finish anything because I was just too much of a fuck up to be able to, to do it prior to that. <laughs> I, I always wanted to. I think as long as I can remember, I wanted to. I, I assumed that there was probably some sort of online community around like the B games that yep. you talk about a lot, obviously. The community I was involved in was uh, Tig Source forums, which uh, Derek Yu of, of Spelunky fame yeah. was running these forums. And mm -hmm. I guess I, I, this is so embarrassing, but I, I read about those forums on Penny Arcade, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, that guy saying that he was getting his uh, indie games news there. And it's like, what are indie games? And then I went and looked and it was just, it was at, it, at that stage just was super um, vibrant community of people making mostly kind of free things, mostly in Flash or Game Maker or uh, Multimedia Fusion. And um, I was like, I have a copy of Flash because I've been doing like web development. And also I, I was working on my uh, PhD dissertation in philosophy and I really, really did not want to write it. Like, I don't think you understand how intensely I didn't want to write it. And I, I guess I remember it would have been like three in the morning. I'd spent the entire day doing nothing. Uh, and I was supposed to be finishing my, my PhD. And uh, it's like three in the morning. This is a good time to start learning a new skill. <laughs> I'm going to make a video game. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And it was possible because of, of those uh, online communities. And you live in Australia. It's like, it's difficult to find people who are interested in games. Not like America where there's old ladies playing dots on the train. Yeah. Nobody's playing games. It's like, it was kind of more or less invisible to me. So I just was able to get British and, and American friends over the internet. And uh, that that's, was the kind of turning point for me. Yeah. Uh, Veros wants to know, I actually was curious about this myself. I'm sure you're familiar now. Uh, the speedrunners in particular are using these uh these names to identify certain locations on the mountain mm -hmm. did you end up giving your or did you end up having like your own internal code names for different areas as well or no no nothing like no, that. i just used the speedrunners names oh good yeah there you go <laughs> <laughs> no for me it was uh you know checkpoint three checkpoint nine yeah yeah, yeah. okay mm -hmm. i love those names though they're great that's really good mm-hmm uh, I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit, actually, about a, a post that you wrote on your website uh, this year uh, mm. called 11 Flavors of Frustration, because I feel like that was kind of a lot of the fuel. And you mentioned that you started making Getting Over It in about January, which is when you wrote this post, too. So yep. it seems yep. like that's kind of where time. your mindset was. Mm -hmm. So can you t tell me a little bit more about like what these all, like how significant they ended up being to Getting Over It as well? Yeah, I mean, that was what was going on in my mind. I was thinking really deeply about this game, Sexy Hiking, but but also some of the other games that I was playing at that time. I'd been uh, co-oping Punishment 2, and I'd been playing Zip Zap. I think Zip Zap was super important to this game, actually. I don't know if you've played it. It's a Philip Stollemeyer mobile game. Uh, he's this German developer. He made a game called Pancake and a game called Burger, which I think are a little better, better known. Pancake, you just have a pan, that you can just move like this and you just try to flip a pancake without dropping it. And it's, that's it. Just tap the screen and <laughs> flip the pancake. But it's like way, way, way harder than that, right? Because it's like this physics pancake and you're trying to just do it perfectly. And I, I love the simplicity of it and the kind of frustratingness of it. And then he sort of made an abstract version of that called uh, Zip Zap, where um, it's just like uh, hinges. It's like little kind of construction set pieces that are set up a certain way. And when you tap the screen, something happens and you're trying to get an object from one place to another. And I just loved, like there was a sense of, um, I just, I was playing it at some point and I realized how much I had come to uh, become a connoisseur of this certain feeling that I got when I would just almost get the, the, the goal in that game. And I was like, it's weird that we spend so much time in games trying to stop people from being frustrated. Yeah. And that was on my mind. Cause I'm always like teaching students to make their games. And I mean, I'm always telling them how to make their games less frustrating too. And it's it struck me as weird that here I am attracted to it as a player, 
but I'm helping people to kind of stay away from it because it's kind of orthodoxy in design. Right. Yeah. And we, just generally, I think as a culture, we don't do a good job of talking about things that are kind of constructed as negative feelings, but you might want some version of it in a particular way, pain, frustration, confusion, uh, you know, um, depression, anger, all of those sorts of things we, we, we crack up as being just purely negative. But we're all, I think, drawn to them in certain times or certain contexts. Like even just seeing a sad movie, right? Yeah. yeah. You feel sad or you scary movie, you feel scared. Those aren't good feelings, but you can enjoy them. Yeah. Uh, and I, I kind of wanted, I thought that was interesting terrain for a game, I guess. That reminds me a lot of that philosophy you were always trying to convince us of, Ryan. You, you got to have a little bit of nastiness in your life to appreciate the, the good stuff, right? Well, I, I genuinely believe that essentially like uh, people don't suffer enough and they get so <laughs> addicted to good feelings they can't ever tackle bad feelings sometimes when they happen. So I think a good dose of constructive punishment and unpleasantness can be very valuable. Mm -hmm. Isn't it interesting that we accept this implicitly with food, right? It's like... We give animals uh, in, in like lab tests, we give them bitter food as a punishment. It's really clearly a punishment to have bitterness. But we definitely appreciate it as, as regular people, right? If, if I said to you, oh, I will never eat a bitter food, you'd think, what an idiot, right? You're missing out on it. <laughs> That's surprisingly apt for our group. You know, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. well, that'll be <laughs> But yeah, so I, I think it's, it's weird that we, we can accept this so readily with, uh, w with some of our senses and not with others, right? There's nobody who's like, oh, I collect annoying sounds. Yeah, yeah. Huh. But you, you could, I mean, you could learn to appreciate that. Mm -hmm. You could just listen to like Cotton Eye Joe all day long. <laughs> <laughs> There's gotta be like, one person out there where Cotton Eye Joe is their favorite song. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure There's probably true. like 10,000 and that's <laughs> yeah, very probably like 10 million. All <laughs> southern United States. There's yeah. probably like I want to apologize. Million. I want to apologize uh, to anybody who really loves that song. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing to apologize for. <laughs> My question to Ryan is, so when does the bitterness stop and you start appreciating me for who I am? That's a good question. I, li I like you just fine. <laughs> <laughs> we, got, we got no problem there. Uh, I I, I want to get your insight on this because I feel like you have a, a great foundation for this uh, conversation. Uh, the you, I'm sure you're familiar. EA's been on the hot seat recently because of the whole microtransaction loot box nonsense. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Your... Uh, your PhD, I assume, is uh, the uh, philosophy which was focused on the relationship between addiction and free will. Is, is that accurate? Uh, almost, yeah. My, my postdoc was about that. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. my, my PhD was actually about uh, medicines that make you live longer. Oh. But, yeah, I pivoted to, I did a whole bunch of work on, on addiction and, and free will stuff, yeah. Okay. So yeah, so I because you have that foundation, I was really curious about how you feel about how the industry is going since you know you've obviously done a lot of work there. This is the time in our life where we get the taste of bitterness from the games company. So we have to learn to appreciate. That. <laughs> I you know I, I, part of this is just me being like an old fart, like an old fashioned about this stuff. I hate loot boxes in games. Mm -hmm. I hate them, but it's not because I think that they're addictive uh maybe that's bad I, I, I would talk about that separately but first of all the reason that i don't like them is i i don't like how it changes the emotional flavor of the of the game right yeah i don't like playing a game to get a loot box uh that's not what i want to be oriented towards when i'm playing the game and i particularly don't like when the loot boxes have uh you know uh things that change the gameplay in them in significant ways. And I think that, that the game companies generally know that, which is why every, almost everything in, in them is either cosmetic or very, very weak tea. You know, if you're playing Battlefield or Call of Duty now and you open up those, you know, the, the crates, it's pay to win in a sense because you get like some kind of minor advantage. You've got like some kind of... Uh, um, what, like, kick, like a like a kickback suppressor or a, a slightly different scope or something like that. 
but they're tuned so they don't make too much difference because it would ruin competitive play if they did make any kind of difference at right, all. Yeah. But what that means is you're putting all this effort into grinding for upgrades that just suck. Like, again, mm-hmm. I know it's, this is, it's naff to talk about uh, Dark Souls, but Dark Souls, here's what's good about it more than anything else is that the upgrades are huge. They're really, really different from each other. And it's one of the reasons it doesn't really work as a competitive game, but it's like, it's like, it's a big deal to get a new sword in Dark Souls. It can make a huge difference to how the game plays. And you can't do that in, in, uh, in Battlefield. It would ruin it. Right. Sort of more or less, right. So at least as far as the, the crates, the loot boxes go. So that's kind of why I, I hate, that I think it's it's just the enemy of a good game system, having to have it kind of linked to this sort of uh, this system where we're trying not to break the balance of the game, but we're also kind of trying to break it a little bit. Uh, so I hate it for that reason. Yeah. The question of whether it's addictive or not is tricky. Uh, basically, my the, the the view that I um, published a bunch of papers about in in uh, in various journals is after looking at all of the different uh, research and synthesizing a bunch of stuff and talking to experts from gambling research and drugs and, uh, and food addiction, like, uh, you know, like binge eating disorder, I guess, mm. and uh, sex addiction, I just couldn't escape the view in the end that anything that you do where you are willfully pursuing a pleasurable behavior, whatever it might be, is going to be a habit for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just it's just the same if you, if you get some pleasure out of those loot boxes it's just like a scratchy ticket or something like that you know like a gambling yeah uh you get a little uh little reward when you when you open them up even if it's tiny um and if you do that enough times you're gonna form a habit for it now that means it's addictive but i don't think you should I mean, I think on the other hand, we have to realize how many things are addictive. I, I can't really get on the board with this idea. Oh, it's addictive. Therefore, uh, either nobody should be able to do it or children should not be able to do it or, you know, whatever it might be. Playing the video games in the first place is addictive, right? Yeah, in that yeah. sense. And, and uh, you know, children, <laughs> speaking from my own experience, can develop uh, a sort of unhealthy patterns of playing games as well. You know, I, I used to play games for, you know, like just, to the exclusion of everything else, just thousands and thousands of hours. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not trying to make it kind of, and I turned out okay, kind of. Uh, <laughs> uh, but and it's just to say, getting rid of loot boxes doesn't take this away from this part of the culture or from any part of being alive. It's like one of the things about being alive. It's one of the things you have to learn growing up is how to go deep on a pleasurable behavior and not lose yourself in it or lose yourself and then come back uh, that's the challenge of being alive, especially as time goes on, we're able to spend more and more of our time on uh, leisure activities as the standard of living goes up and up over the centuries. Uh, this becomes more and more of a part of what it is to be alive. And so, yeah, I mean, you can design a game that's less habit forming. In some ways that might be a worse game. Depends, right? Like depends what part of it was, was the habit forming part. I had this uh, argument with uh, Frank Lance, a Drop7 designer, a paper, universal paperclips designer and, and the chair of my department, uh, where he convinced me of this like several years ago. We were talking about, I was, I was complaining about Diablo. I'm like, well, it's just using like, uh, there's this psychological concept of intermittent reinforcement, which mm-hmm. is to say that things become more habit forming if the reward only happens randomly. Mm-hmm. It happens every time it's less less likely, less apt to, to form habits. And I was like, well, that's just abusive, right? Like, so, so if you're designing Diablo, you should, shouldn't have randomized loot. It should be more like the Dark Souls. And he said, well, but that's what I like about Diablo. That's where my pleasure is coming from, mm-hmm. is that uncertainty about what my loot is going to be like. And I thought about it for, for some time, and I'm like, yeah, well, maybe that is a type of pleasure. Maybe that is like... I don't want to remove pleasure from video games, right? Mm-hmm. Are you sure um, that's my... not your ML Bennett, Bennett Foddy? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't the next step to that conversation 
okay, that's one thing if we're just talking within the game zone systems, but once you introduce a monetization element to it, does it then transcend to a different category? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it, it definitely complicates it. it yeah. I, I, I suspect here's what I think. I, it's not like I think that games and money can never be fruitfully woven together. I think that po playing poker with friends for a small amount of money is great. And I think poker is clearly more pleasurable uh, when money is involved than when it's not. Mm -hmm. That's my experience of playing poker. If you play for jelly beans, it's just, it's just not as good of a game. Yeah. But I do think that it's a design terrain that's difficult. And I think like, yeah. for example, if you compare Diablo two to Diablo three, where suddenly real money is involved in the loot system, and it seems like it just makes it worse. It's making it less pleasurable. And they had to redesign that thing a whole bunch of times just to try to fix that. Because I think the players felt this as well. It's one thing, though, to be playing poker with your friends where everybody's kind of got an equal stake in it. But when you're talking essentially to a sort of a faceless corporation on the other side who is the other part of that, like, yep. there is no give and take there, you know? Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, it's like... Uh, poker is sort of like self-balancing in that if you play with friends. I think poker is a worse game if you play with strangers and you don't know how much money they have in it and there's yeah. like no limit. I think that's a worse game, for example. Uh, but, but yeah, it's like uh, that is exactly one of the things that is wrong with the, with the auction house in, in Diablo, mm -hmm. the gold system in World of Warcraft and all of those sorts of things. And, uh, and with a lot of those... those a lot of those different kind of ways that people have woven real money into, into games. But I just, I think what I would say is it's just poorly understood. It's like, right. And that makes it very hard to design. Well, I, I don't think I could do a great job of it. And there are really, really smart designers spending their whole lives trying to do this for like Riot and Blizzard and so on. And, and they don't always get it right because it's a really, really tough yeah. problem. Um, and if you looked only at the games where this was done super well, you might not dislike the, the loot box system. You might not dislike the multiple currencies or whatever. It's just tough. And it's tough partly because you're under this financial pressure that is maybe sometimes the enemy of good design. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for me, I feel like, as you said yourself, the focusing on the monetization, I feel, is distracting from the conversation of, is this game fun? Is, yep. is, are we going down the right path? No, we're, sometimes we're worrying so much about making money that, well, the game is sort of an afterthought then. Yeah. Right. But this, and that's, this is that's all a byproduct of, of how expensive it is to make games now, right? Yeah. It's like 60 bucks is not enough to finance Destiny. It's just not. Mm -hmm. uh, they can't get enough players on Destiny to be able to make that game and sell it for 60 bucks. And maybe that means you shouldn't make games like that. I don't that's, know. <laughs> that's where I often take the conversation, but I, I get both sides. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I appreciate a really good sort of quadruple A game as much as anybody. Those those Uncharted games, which don't have any uh, particular microtransactions in them, as far as I can look, not many. Um, I love. And it would be sad as as kind of weirdly uh, um, wasteful as that game can be. It would be sad if those things did not exist and if that bar was not being pushed by somebody. Uh, feel free, chat at Roundtable Podcast. We still got questions for Bennett Foddy. Uh, speaking of recent AAA releases, then anything in particular that you've had your hands on? Uh, you mentioned the motion controls on the Switch. Have you gotten your hands on Odyssey yet? Uh, I have played some Odyssey. You know, I was like one of the world's biggest 3D Mario fans. Yeah, yeah. And I like the new one a bunch, but it hasn't grabbed me the way that uh, some of the previous ones mm -hmm. did. Really, uh, the 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 game that they made that has most impressed me is, uh, is of course uh, Zelda. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I think why? That's, yeah, I'm curious because yeah, I am a man of like Zelda was a good game, but it was far from great. Here's what I like about it. I I I got to put in the background here that I hated Skyward Sword so much. Oh, Same with you. Yeah, Skyward completely Sword hated it. Terrible. I was so angry. I got like. 80, 90% of the way through that game and I just flipped and I, this has never happened before. I got up, I unplugged the Wii, I put it in a drawer and then shortly <laughs> afterwards I threw it away. Threw it <laughs> and I did not buy another Nintendo game oh my until God. Switch came out. I was mad at them. It just made me angry to think about that game. Uh, and 
I think when you're in charge of a franchise like Zelda, it must be like, it's like almost impossible to steer that ship, right? It's got so much momentum. Yeah. Meaning, meaning your fans have so much expectations and also so much of the future of the company is riding on it. And it's got so much history and it must just feel almost possible to make any changes. And in that situation, they took a game that was always basically like an action puzzle game and turned it into a simulation. They changed genre. Really, I mean, honestly, yeah. most of what you're doing in there is an immersive sim. It's not, it's not, it has little puzzle moments, but it's not anything like a, like, like Skyward Sword. Yeah, yeah. Uh, except maybe at the most cosmetic level. And that's, that's so gutsy. That's got so much bravery to it. That's what I liked about it the whole time, just thinking like, here is a roadmap. Maybe this isn't the kind of perfect embodiment of it. Like maybe, maybe this isn't the best example of what this game could be, but this is a roadmap for a game that I care about buying again mm -hmm. out of nowhere, which I totally did not expect. And now I can imagine not necessarily future Zelda games, but games that are inspired by this that I'm super excited about. Right. And it also reinvigorated my interest in immersive Sims, which I also had completely lost interest in like uh, you know, the Deus Ex games and so on. Like, uh, I reached a point where it seemed very uh, predictable. Yeah, uh, I, I'm not even a big like I, I like Dishonored reasonably well, but not to the point where I wanted to play the uh, sequel. Um, I loved back in the day. Of course, I loved System Shock like like a lot of people. Um, Did you play the new Prey? I didn't. Should I play it? It's good. It is mm -hmm. as somebody who loved System Shock too. It's what I imagined System Shock would be now. It's it so is. interesting. It's like it's that's, very RPG. Uh, yeah. Every though every level is wide open for you to kind of just do, figure it out on your own. You can, right. you can be like a hacker. Or you can be someone who's good at guns. Uh, yeah. it's, it's I great. mean that's where these things are at their best is where it really feels uh, a light touch from the designer, and it's not like they're trying to force you to play in a particular way. Mm -hmm. That's so unexpected for Zelda, right? Because that's exactly what's wrong with Skyward Sword. The whole thing is on rails to the to the ultimate degree. And mm -hmm. even though it's on rails, it still feels the need to explain everything to you in yeah. text. Yeah. And uh, tremendously condescending, I found. Yeah. And they threw that away. That's so amazing. That's really, really great. And t they even abandoned the central tenant of Zelda games, which is the lock and key mechanism. Like yeah. they completely just scrapped it all yeah. the way back to nothing. Which the fact crazy. that you can, you can like basically ride a horse from the beginning of the game yeah. to the end and win in 10 minutes, that's bravery in my, in my mind. I think that's really, really, uh, that's really great. Yeah. So that's the AAA game of the year for me easily. That's great. Cool. Uh, here's, here's a good one for you. Waffle Sock wants to know, as a graduate student, any tips on motivation while working toward a completed thesis? Oh, yeah. Um, Make your procrastination valuable. <laughs> okay, yeah. This will not help you to finish the thesis. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, when I was doing my thesis, what did I do? I was in a rock and roll band for a little while. That was really valuable to me. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I ran a business making TV commercials for mobile phone ringtones back in the flip phone days. Uh, that was really cool as well. Like I was kind of figuring out how to do business stuff. And yeah, and then I started making games. And none of this helped me to get my dissertation finished. <laughs> uh, but the, those were great times. There's no power. There's no force in the universe more powerful than procrastination. You should just embrace it and, and put it towards good. Because I don't think you can switch it off. I think that if you're a person who procrastinates, that's just part of your personality. May as well put it to some use. I like that. Is your music available anywhere? Yeah, the band is called uh, Cut Copy. Um, it's an Australian band. They're still around. They, uh, I, I'm only on the first record, so if you want to, if you want to hear it, it's just the first cool. one. But um, yeah, it's on Spotify. They, uh, they're doing really well since I left. They got really cool, and you know, they got nominated for a Grammy and stuff. So wow, wow. yeah, so reasonably. Yeah. yeah, I just saw them recently. Actually, they came and played in New York City. They're on a big national tour right now. Just pick up their new record. It's good. That's awesome. All kinds uh, of yeah. discoveries today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, chat got moving pretty quick there. I'm, I'm yeah, missing. Yeah, they tend to. Yeah. Uh, well, 
I do. I know uh, quite a few people have been asking this question, so I'll go ahead and uh, present it myself. Uh, what's next mm -hmm. for Bennett Foddy? Well, I've got to get everything settled down with bug fixes on this. Um, I'm going to try to put it on uh, out in China on Tencent's uh, server, serv uh, service called Wii Game as well. So it's a little bit of like, you can't just put out a Steam game and just say you're done, right? Yeah. You've got to support it for a little while. For your uh, whole so life, I think, is how it goes. <laughs> yeah, it's a contract. <laughs> Curse for the rest of your life. Um, let's see, I've got some little things. I'm, I'm tying up a little project called uh, Foiled, which is uh, just a thing I'm making with some friends at, at NYU. It's just going to be an arcade cabinet. You might be able to eventually see in, a, in one of those barcades uh, around major cities. Um, we're pretty far along on that, so I'll, I'll do some work on that. But that's like a side project. My main project, I guess I'm going to be back to uh, prototyping for a little while, trying some new ideas, all the stuff I couldn't do while I was trying to get this thing wrapped. Yeah. But uh, also I need to sleep for about a week. Sure. <laughs> That's reasonable. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the Half-Blood Jew wants to know, can you talk a bit of, it's just a username, can you talk a bit about <laughs> the snake? I'm not sure if you already did and I missed it, but the snake struck me as such an interesting and clever design choice. Yeah, it, it, the idea springs from a joke, right? Mm -hmm. It's snakes and ladders. Uh, one of the things about snakes and ladders, I guess, if you are from a puritanical American city, then shoots and ladders is that it's always the case that there is a, uh, a snake towards the end of the game that takes you back to the beginning, right? They always lay out the board that way. And uh, I guess rubber banding for children. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, <laughs> if somebody gets a bunch of uh, high dice rolls in a row and they're way out in front, you can still believe that the game is still on. Um, so that's not what is going on with my game, but I think that's such a classic thing. I wanted a little joke about snakes and ladders. Mm -hmm. uh, so it starts with a joke, but then I thought, um, I, I've got this snake, snake here, and I want to, I want to, it just seemed like an opportunity to put you on this kind of interesting dilemma because you've gone so far. And you're going to wonder about this snake. It's going to look like it, it does what you think it's going to do. Mm -hmm. But you're not, not going to be sure. And the game has kind of been trolling you a little bit just before that with the jump scares and stuff. I think, well, maybe uh, maybe I'm supposed to do this. Again, just seemed yep. like the funniest idea in the universe to me. <laughs> uh, and I thought putting like a do not ride snake above it would be like even more. And I just love, that's some of what I love most watching streams of this game actually is the look <laughs> on the face of, the, of somebody who gets there and doesn't know about it. Because <laughs> they stop and they just look, they're like, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not obvious you can go up uh, in the first place. But yeah. even, if you think, even if you think you can go up, uh, it's not clear what the correct decision is. Mm -hmm. And I think people know at their kind of gut level that they, that they shouldn't go on the snake, but they want to know. <laughs> <laughs> The juxtaposition of it with the bucket is perfect because it is really that uh, that just a little bit of uncertainty that is so perfectly executed in that moment. Right, right. And I think the game has maybe started to set itself up as like an unreliable narrator and, uh, yeah. and you, you, you're not exactly uh, sure what, the, what to think of it. And uh, most people don't take it, but, but some of them do. So I think I, I got it about right. That's what I wanted. It's like a, yeah. maybe 10, 20% of people uh, go on the snake. Um, I wish I could keep uh, like a secret recording of everybody who ever does it. Uh, <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> I'm sure that there's some people who have really lost their temper over that snake. Yeah. You wrote that snake right there? Oh, yeah. No, I had a couple of fun times. <laughs> it's really good when you're doing a speed run also and you're at the point where you're like, well, I've blown my splits, so I'm basically, this run's over. Might as yeah. well ride the snake. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Everybody loves riding the snake and they'll just spam the snake into its chat and goes by a million miles an hour. It's mm -hmm. good fun. I would definitely say as a condolence to anybody who uh, whoever has ridden it and felt bad, uh, I've ridden it by accident two or three times, just yeah. legit trying to get to the top. So yeah, I definitely <laughs> feel your pain. <laughs> Uh, Turtle, Turtwee wants to know, says, oh, hold on, I just lost it. Uh, the poetry is a nice touch to the game. What was the thought process behind adding it, and how did you choose the pieces? Um, the condolence poetry, I guess he means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. The first take of all of voiceover for this game um, was much more, the tone was much, much less encouraging 
and much more kind of making fun of the person who had fallen down, mm -hmm. which was my first impulse. Uh, but then when I listened to it back, I was like, this is, it's not the right tone, right? It's like, it's enough if I'm just encouraging and maybe just the slightest hint of a kind of, uh, of a wink. Uh, so I thought, well, you, you might be feeling pretty bad, but it's different, you know, after a while you can't say, uh, oh, you fell a long way, right? Like you want to say something that's, that's somehow um, a bit more interesting. And so I, I went looking for uh, things that people say when somebody's died or when somebody's had like a disease or uh, things like that. And it turns out the internet is just like full of these things. Like, that's surprising, just, yeah. It's, yeah no, it's really surprising. <laughs> you just look for condolence quotes, there's just a million of them. And I just really liked some of them. And it just really, uh, it seemed like a thing where I could do it. I could read it in a sincere way. Yeah. But it's also a little bit insulting. It's like a, it's like I a took hand. it as a hundred percent insulting. Right. Well, <laughs> it's like, I want it to be like, uh, somebody is trying to, to be nice, but they're bad at it. That makes yeah, sense. Yeah. So the internet. Yeah. <laughs> Simple yeah, wants exactly. to know, uh, anti design, sorry, he says anti design is very interesting to me as a game dev student. Do you have any papers or articles about that topic that you could share? I don't, you know, I don't because it's, I think there are, there, I think there is, um, a literature on anti design in other media, in, in, uh, like in traditional design media. Uh, I'm not well versed in it. Mm -hmm. uh, I've just discovered this as a recent trend in games. I think it's coming, it's not coming out of literacy in, architecture or industrial design or anything like that. I think it's just coming up out of, uh, you know, out of whole cloth in, in video games, partly because of the recent history of games and the kind of, auth I think wherever you have really strong orthodoxies in a creative form, you start to get the opposite of that coming in. It's like, hey, have you considered this? You know, you've, you've had this, try this. Uh, I think that's where it's coming from, and it's really recent. So no, there's not really much to read on it that I'm that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I would say that that some of the inspiration came from I read uh, Jesper Yule's uh, book about failure. I forget the name escapes me right now, but it's his book from about five years ago, um, which was definitely interesting and inspiring to me. He's just trying to understand how failure can be rewarding. And he opens with this kind of little, just to give you a flavor of the, the writing about it. He's talking about uh, Meteos, that uh, I guess a Nintendo DS game, the DS. I played that. Yeah. Well, and he's like, this is the only time this has ever happened to me, but I went to play Meteos and I was really looking forward to it. And I sat down to play it and I got all the way through the game without failing even once. And in a way, wow. that's perfect difficulty curve, right? Because he, uh, he just got better at the exact rate that the game got mm. more difficult. But he said, I felt robbed at the end. You know, felt uh, super disappointed and, and uh, deprived of the experience that I wanted to have. So for him, that was like the, the moment that he, he realized that um, there was something about the failure that was part of the pleasure, or at least was structuring pleasure for him. Yeah, yeah. And that's a kind of an anti-design idea in a way, right? Because it's like to say, well, uh, traditional uh, design goals in, in video game development lead you to a result that's maybe not what you want because you're ignoring some kind of elements of... We don't always have a good understanding of what it is we, we like about something. Uh, and especially if what we like is something that seems bad, like failure. So uh, that was inspiring to me. Do you think there's a correlation with anti-design and physics modeling in games that since they're not really a binary, like yes or no thing, it's more of an analog interaction, it yeah. gives a lot more room for this kind of thing to develop? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good observation, actually. I think that if you think about, maybe there's like two different veins of video games from the very beginning, simulation and design, right? Simulation is sort of inherently anti-design because you're right. really just trying to kind of recreate a real life system, which is not designed a lot of the time. Uh, great example would be if you, if you look at all the cricket games of history, um, and I've played a bunch of them, a huge number of them, I don't know if you know anything about cricket, but cricket is played over five days. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, one big part of it, if you, if you play a game for five days outside in England, uh, it's going to rain, gonna, right? It's going to rain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a, a few of those. Yeah. So it's normal in England, like the game is designed with that built in. So you presume you'll have three or four good days of play. And um, get the games that, that are cricket games very frequently have rain delays in them. Now, rain delays are not a good design, right? That's just, you can't play right now. You've got to sit and wait while some simulated rain comes past and you're going to watch the screen. It's going to rain. It's about as interesting as it sounds. Yeah. Uh, but it's just an example of how design and simulation are, are opposite. And in sports games, mm. we often go to simulation. And in physics games, are obviously just simulations, right? Uh, but yeah, it can, be, it can be contrary to design. I guess maybe part of my perspective on this comes from the fact that I've played a lot of sports games and I like them. Cool. Uh, getting a repeated question. I'll... I'll... I got it, Chad. How much do you think your background in philosophy influences your uh, game design? I don't think it has influenced very many of my previous games. It influences this game. This game starts with basically what's like a critical theory lecture. I mean, that is yeah. setting you up for the, the wrong idea, but that's where I started it out. So it's def definitely directly informing this game. But, I, you know, I... I did philosophy for 10 years mm -hmm. and uh include if i include my my phd and um full time and and that that felt like more than enough and i kind of wanted to move like in the in the absolute opposite direction uh and make things that were kind of uh mindless like when we were doing sports friends like that's it's really not a cerebral game it's uh it's twitch you know it's it's uh intuition and reflex yeah. And uh, it's only now that I'm starting to get to the point where I feel like I can bring that a little bit back. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, usually it doesn't. Starting to come back into my thinking now. I'm just now realizing you made Super Pole Riders yep. part of Sports Friends. I friggin' love that yeah, game. Yeah, that was that all our favorite game. Yeah. So much fun. <laughs> that was really good. <laughs> so, thank you for that. In a way, uh, my new game is, is, is just that game, right? As a single player game. Yeah. No, a little oh, bit, yeah. Huh? When you think about it, <laughs> that did not occur to me actually. <laughs> In fact, when you, when I don't know if you've ever played that Flash original of Pole Riders, regular Pole Riders mm. had a single player mode where you run back and forth and you you vault over solid objects. Huh. And I had originally had the idea. Uh, in fact, back before I ever played Sexy Hiking, um, you know, two thousand and I'm going to say nine or so, I had the idea that that regular pole riders were going to have this kind of adventure mode, single player mode where you go over a kind of landscape and try to, and try to pole vault up over it. Uh, so it, in a way, this game is just that. And it's an idea that's been percolating in my mind for a long time. Uh, but it took a long time for computers to get fast enough and uh, for my, for my skills to get good enough to be able to do it. Yeah. But I did. I did actually try to do it before. It just didn't, uh, didn't work out. So yeah, super pole riders is just, uh, just having the competitive two-player version of that, four players. That's awesome. Cool. All right. Anything else I'm missing? Y'all got any? Is there any chance of workshop support or level editor support at any point? Uh, I, yeah, I don't expect a yes. I just, I yeah, would yeah, yeah, of course the answer is is not for this release. Um, yeah. It's selling really well, so you know I could definitely imagine that I will want to do like a sequel in the future once I've recuperated uh, yeah. and maybe done a couple of other small things. Um, and if I was going to do a sequel, I would build in editor support from the beginning because I think that's cool. That would be great. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you can't take a, a thing that's been kind of handcrafted in, in Unity yeah. and be like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to make an editor for this. It doesn't yeah. work that way. I was, I was uh, more curious if you're just going to say it sort of runs antithetical to the point of it being sort of pre-designed. Well, it doesn't because I mean anybody yeah. else's mountain that they made would also be pre-designed, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I don't think I, guess, yeah. I, I would love to play uh, mountains that other people had made. I would need to make the cool. editor expressive enough uh, that they could be their own little stories. And I think the kind of best example I could think of of a system like that is uh, Knit Stories, the Niflis game. So he made Knit, K N Y T T, and that's like a 
minimalistic platformer from many years ago, and then he made Knit Stories, which had an editor in it. And people made all these different, uh, still just like jumping is all that's in that game. It doesn't have any other verbs. And people still made really, really interesting uh, stories and like kind of personal things, touching things, really surprising things that I think was a source of kind of really great joy for Niflis being able to take his system and see what other people brought to it. Uh, so I would love to do that. And if I can't do that, I think it would be fun to get other designers to design some DLC mountains. That might be cool. Oh yeah. I'd, like I'd that. be happy to do it. I've done level design before. Ooh. Yeah. Well, get, yeah. <laughs> Getting over it with Bennett Foddy with somebody else. I think that would be, yeah. that would be kind of cool. Uh, that makes me think of, uh, did you play V, 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 V? Yeah. yeah. I, you know, people don't know this. I named all the rooms in V, 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 V. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> so, so you definitely did play it then. Yeah, I, did. I played it a whole <laughs> bunch. <laughs> but yeah, I was just going to say, so in that game, they did like, you know, a bunch of different devs submitted some level designs for uh, V, 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 Yeah, I love those levels. Yeah, 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 I love those levels. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, that that I really I really liked. I actually I use that as a kind of a teaching thing. I get students to use to use that editor and, and go through those levels. That's so awesome. yeah, I think I think it could be great. You know, if, if I had an editor in my game, there would be so many ideas that I didn't think of that I would get to see, and I'd be like, oh, you know, like that would be really really uh, nice. So maybe for a future sequel. Yeah. Cool. Thank you for indulging me on that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for indulging us, Bennett Foddy. Yeah. I appreciate it's your been a pleasure. time here. Absolutely. Uh, Is, thanks, for, thanks so much for having me. It's been really great to talk to you. I mean, I, 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 uh, there's been uh, really great things to think about. And I, I, you know, having these sorts of conversations actually helps me to get clear about what I think about this stuff. And I really appreciate that as well. Great. Yeah. And is there anything you'd like to promote here on the platform? No, just buy my game. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Getting over it is now on Steam. We don't have to re redirect people to the Humble website anymore. It's on Steam. Eight bucks, right? Yep, yep. 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 absolutely. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Well, that is Bennett Foddy here joining us on Roundtable Live today. Thank you all for joining us on Roundtable Live today as well. We appreciate you being here. Uh, thank you so much for watching here on twitch.tv slash roundtable podcast, which is where the show airs on Fridays at 3 o'clock Pacific time, 6 o'clock Eastern. Uh, we are going to be on next week, I believe, as well. You can follow us at Roundtable PC on Twitter to get the updates there. Also, catch the VOD over on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash BearTaffy, if you missed it, here on Twitch. want to thank those of you who supported here on Twitch and Patreon as well today. Thank you guys so much. Uh, that includes Non Pondo, uh, Espleby, Shin, Wearetable, Yankee Scouser, uh, Guilty, Steve, Midori Sensei, Neku Soul, Benson and Hodges, uh, Spedrickson, Valhalla Warrior, and BRD Wizard, thank you guys so much for these. Oh, and uh, my BFF Jake as well. Thank you guys so much for the support over on Twitch and over on Patreon.com slash Roundtable where you can send a few bucks a month to uh, keep the show going. Really appreciate you doing that. want to thank those of you at the $20 tier and above, including Julian Avelsgar, Jonathan Graham, Scrotty119, Ricky Grice, Simurfet, Cowboy Chemist, Eric Schooley, Stephen Aoki, Metadata Studios, James Peed, Peter Sinison, Ellis Spice, John Kalchik, O. Thomas Games BR, Jakar Sampson with a dance number, Kulnar, Sahoa, Joseph Boss, Pendulette, Talks to Wall, Chaos, So No One Told You Life Was Going to Be This Way, Theorist. Oh my God, is he starting the Friends theme song? <laughs> he is starting the Friends God theme damn song. God damn it. Colby yeah, Klein, <laughs> Greenlight, Orin Saltzman, Brizzle Brit, Positron, Myth Scare, Mediocrities, Justin, Logan Ray. Thank you all so, so very, very much for keeping the support alive over on Patreon.com slash Roundtable. Thank you very much, Bennett, again, for joining us today. Thank you all for being here. We'll see you next week. Goodbye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye.